Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. My name is Quinn Castellane. I am the VP of Block Therapy, and we have Deanna Hansen, of course, who is the founder of Block Therapy. And today we're going to be talking about a requested topic from somebody in our community, which is about fascia bands, also known as Schultz bands. And Deanna is going to be explaining a little bit more on this and really how important they are and just what we need to understand about them. So let's just start off with what are fascia bands? Because when I think of fascia, I think of just the matrix, the web, and how it connects all system cells, structures, fibers in the body together. But now there's these bands. So what are these fascia bands and where are they located? Uh, well, great question. So it was actually Gary Sharp, one of our community members who, um, if any of you struggle with Parkinson's disease, he has a fantastic website called Outthinking Parkinson's. Mm. So he had actually shared our very first podcast on fascia and, or just basically just on fascia. Yeah, what is fascia? And um, in this had the description of the Schultz bands, which I hadn't heard of specifically. And actually, if you Google it, you won't find the Schultz bands anymore on the web. Um, it was in a book I call, I think it was the, um, the, the web, the fascia web. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think that was the title of the book. So it, very interesting though, because our community often asks, you know, can you give us the cause sites for specific issues in the body. Mm. And I'm always a little tentative to do that because there's chaos in the body and I've assessed so many bodies and there's some general things that we'll definitely see, but everybody is so unique in how their body adheres. But ultimately the Schultz bands, there's seven of them. And this makes total sense because they basically wrap around the joints or wherever there's fault lines in the body. So just think of if we were linear in nature and we started tipping forward, the body is going to have to create scaffolding mm. or um, support structures to stop us from fully tipping. So basically the seven Schultz bands, they wrap around the hip joint. So right at the base of the pelvis and then at the top of the pelvis, there's one and two. Okay. Then we have one right in the center, right at the belly button where we tend to just automatically collapse. Mm -hmm. Then So that's three. And then four and five really surround the shoulder joints. So just below uh, the breasts for for the ladies and then up and through here in the neck that's where are we at four and five five and six <laughs> um there's four and five and then in the neck because we yeah. collapse forward mm. and then the eyes like there, there's a band right around the eyes because again the eyes are like a ball and socket joint so mm. as we start tipping forward and we start pushing into the outer portion of the body that's where these collagen bands are going to start forming and that's going to stop us from tipping because, again, now we've got basically this inelastic property that is holding us up from falling out of balance. So interestingly, there's only seven. And it's funny because whenever I'm looking at the body, it's like, okay, so there's always going to be a need for developing these bands to stop us from tipping. So really, it's all the joints. So I would say there's also Schultz bands or fascia bands around the knee joints around the ankle joint, and then also around the big toe ball, as well as around the elbows, the, the wrists. wrists, and then the thumbs, because these are all those main joints that mm. have to adapt to our movement over time. So, um, but this led me on a whole different, you know, um, path of reading, because years ago, when I really started to open up to this understanding, and I was doing a lot of research, and really looking at the patterns in nature to understand what's going on in the body and to make sense of things that we can't see. Mm. But for me to make sense of the things that I could feel under my fingertips as I was diving through the layers of fascia, I came across the tenet as above, so below. And this has been a huge help for me to understand what's happening in the body. So I just want to talk a little bit about hermeticism because we happen to live in Winnipeg and our golden boy on the top of our parliament building mm -hmm. is actually the representative of Hermes Trismegistus. So as above, so below, apparently comes from the emerald tablets of Hermes Trismegistus from between 200 and 800 BC. So, I mean, written a long time ago, and then there's a whole bunch of discrepancy around that. So we don't need to get into that, but either way, um, Hermeticism is a philosophy. And it's a philosophy where that, that has three parts to it, alchemy, astrology, and thergy. So mm. 
I love the alchemy piece because this is really where things get tied in for us. So alchemy in the traditional definition is the ability to turn lead into gold. But in the bigger concept, it's really about being able to transform a body. Um, you know, even they say like the fermentation process is a form. But what is fascinating is the fact that we are literally through this process of fascia decompression, teaching people how to take their hard physical form and turn it into that fluid matrix mm. through that process of melting. So basically ice to water. That's what we're doing with our fascia, that frozen fascia, we're turning it into healthy fascia where there's optimal flow. So in that sense of the word, the process of fascia decompression is alchemy. And I just, you know, I, I love that because the fact that, I mean, even from my balcony, like I literally face the golden boy, I get to see the golden boy every day. And the fact that this is represented here. Um, but that aside, just because I think that's super interesting information, I, I love it. In fact, if anybody wants to read and dive in deeper to this, there's a really cool book about our parliament building. Um, what's it called again? I remember you mentioning that to me yeah. when I was young. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways, I might have to get back and we have to put it under, I, the, the name is escaping me at the moment, but. Needless to say, when it comes to the concept of as above, so below, and these fascia bands, this is really how we can understand what's happening in the body because everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. What is seen in the spiritual plane is seen in the lower plane. What is seen on the outside of the body is seen on the inside of the body. What is seen on one plane of the body is expressed in that lower plane. So there's all these connections. So if we don't actually have a view of every single cell in the body and what is going on, we can still have a very strong understanding of what is happening. So first of all, whenever I'm assessing people, I always look at what the limbs are doing because the limbs are going to dictate what's happening in the core. Mm. And what I have noticed now over seeing probably thousands of photos of people is that the calves and the feet and the legs in general perfectly mirror what's happening from an alignment perspective in the hands and the arms. Mm. So if we've got that right foot, for example, that's that flat tire, and then the left side is the anchor, that identical m movement mm -hmm. and holding pattern is going to be represented above. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's just one example of that above, as above, so below. But also what we see on the surface of the body and I think we're going to have a really cool discussion about this, is also represented underneath. So I think of stretch marks. So, I mean, you know, women often get stretch marks after pregnancy or um, if you've, uh, I, I had them when, because I hit puberty and it was like, I went from being like super flat chested to not, so had stretch marks. But you often see those stretch marks on bodybuilders in that pec area. Totally. So yeah. those stretch marks that we see on the surface are really that representation of what is happening under the surface so we can see the lines either being straightened or they can be twisting and chaotic but that's how we can get an understanding of where these adhesions are and where we need to work because the outer portion of the body gives us so much information as to what's happening beneath the surface even moles you know that's just basically the apex of a spiral that's accumulating a whole bunch of toxins and debris and it's coming up as a mole mm. so these are those points in the body where we can get information as to where we need to spend some time and focus to really create that decompression and bring that life back in to the fascia matrix. Yeah, because when I think of a fascia, I think of just the chaos of it. So then there's obviously different layers, different kinds of fascia. So these fascia bands are, they, they seem kind of linear. Which is, which is a, an interesting concept because fascia isn't linear. So we're born with these fascia bands. Every single person has a fascia band. So do you think that's almost... So I, I don't think that it, it's not that every person has a fascia band. It's where we naturally tip off balance and then the fascia has to uh, oh, add collagen to create that. And, and I mean, we've, we've had so many conversations before where like you'll talk about how you know, when we start collapsing, each joint has to respond to that collapse. And there's a counterbalancing going on with the 
collagen. So it's trying to protect the joint, essentially. It's Yeah, well, it's trying to stop us from moving further out of that alignment and taking right. longer, basically. So if I'm always leaning to my right, I'm going to have, you know, a buildup, but then the body has to adapt because if we just have a buildup, I mean, that's not mm -hmm. how, we, how we age because we're always compensating to just simply live and move in our bodies. So, for example, you could have three fascia bands. I could have five fascia bands. Some people could have seven, if not more. Is there a way to have no fascia bands? No, I don't think it's that people can have only a few or all of them. I think it's the fact that we all have these weak spots in our system. And as we start to collapse these weak areas, and, and they're, they're only weak because we're not conscious of proper foundation. So where the joints are, there's space in the body to allow for movement in those joints but that space is where there's an opportunity to fall into that space mm -hmm. and to tip off balance so around the joints and around the areas of the body where we don't have like you know between like a bone for example like the bone isn't going to shift unless it breaks right? right but in the joints there can be a shifting of mm -hmm. that alignment so wherever there's joints which is you know throughout the body but these basic ones of again around the hips around the shoulders and then right at the belly button because between the pelvis and the rib cage there's nothing supporting us in mm -hmm. through there so we have this you know obvious collapse that we see through people mm -hmm. so it's basically just these natural areas of the body that are going to tend to be problematic and stickier mm -hmm. because that's where the fascia is supporting those joints from you know again moving so far out of alignment that we fall on our face right right so there is consequences essentially to these fascia bands mm -hmm. and they can become more dense or less dense depending if you are a releasing it b correcting your posture yeah. and actually strengthening the body properly so that we're more in that balance so you will so then what would be an effective way to release them well our whole process is about releasing them but I, th I think it's more of giving people the understanding where they are going to tend to be really sticky. So that would be an area where you would almost want to focus on. Yes. So, okay. So let's say there's, there's a fascia band, let's say right, right in the navel. Yeah. Wraps all the way around. Would you say it's a smart idea to, and, and let me clarify, this wraps all the way around the body. Or is it more of a buildup in the front because we collapse linearly? Exactly. Yes. So we need to almost work in those lines of these fascia bands. So would you say it's a good idea to, let's say, block and release from your left lower ribs to your right lower ribs? Yeah. And I mean, that's really what our whole program is about, right? We, we spend so much time working in the joints of the body. It's also where the lymphatics are. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much in these joint spaces, but... That's the thing. If we haven't supported our correct alignment, all of the beauty that lives in these joint spaces, spaces, which is like the lymphatic system and the ability to move and all of these structures to create um, the bodies that we have today, they become compromised because if we're not conscious, gravity's going to win and then there we compress. So, so yes, again, I think it's more of just information for people to understand because they'll have more pain there. They might feel tighter there more sticky there. Like if you try to draw the fascia away, um, like, you know, like we should be able to pinch the skin and draw it away from the body. But in areas where it's super tight, you can, sometimes you can't even pinch it and, right. and feel that fluidity. Right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, okay. So, so with these fascia bands, how does this impact, let's say pain? Let's focus on like low back pain or okay. back pain in general. Yeah. So, is that going to be a dictator or can you almost tell if somebody has thicker fascia bands that this is going to either cause back pain or you can almost see how this will cause back pain for certain people? For sure. Because again, those fascia bands that become um, built up in the front of the body, they continue to drive the body. Like, so it, that's the paradox, right? They're here to create stability, but they also create greater density. So now gravity is going to grip them and continue pulling on the body at that more rapid pace. And then what's going to happen to the back of the body is 
those cells are going to be fighting, that tissue is going to be fighting that forward pull. So the denser the bands in the front, the more pull on the body in general, creating a greater need for those muscles to try to stop that forward migration. And again, we're talking about a 2,000 pound per square inch seal. These fascia bands grip to bone with that kind of force. So the bigger and the denser they get, the less cells in the back of the body because everything is getting drawn to the front mm -hmm. to support that uprightedness. And that's why sometimes you can see suddenly um, somebody, you know, they've, they've got a certain amount of mobility, but then suddenly like they just kind of tip over, right? Like they, they go from being functional to, okay, now there's no more space left because those bands have taken so much of that collagen mm -hmm. to create those false walls and false floors that there's just a, a, an incredibly imbalanced system left. So all of that elasticity in the back of the body is basically pulled so far apart and there's so much exhaustion because there's not enough cells in there to provide that energy to support the body and its uprightedness mm. that um, we tip off balance. So again, the whole point of this conversation was, um, again, uh, Gary had reached out and um, shared this with us, but it's just more information for people to understand why we have pains where we do, why we address the front of the body, because we've all always naturally addressed the front of the body. It never made sense for me to go to the back of the body until we've released mm -hmm. all of these dense areas in the front so that we could allow that collagen that has been drawn to the front to migrate back to where it should be as we go through the process of releasing and rebuilding to create, again, that balance. Right. So main areas of pain are typically like what you mentioned, where these Schultz bands or these fascia bands are located. So the ankles, I, I sure, let's not say that's a Schultz band or that they might not identify that as a Schultz band, but there's still a fascia band there. Yeah. I remember when I shattered my ankle and I was like looking at the anatomy of it and whatnot, there's a massive band here. So then there's going to be a massive band in the knee. A lot of people have knee pain. Same with the hips, hip pain abdominal pain but not even just abdominal pain that's going to be the cause of the low back pain yeah and then where was the next one um right right basically at the diaphragm that probably is what's going to be causing a lot of mid upper back pain yes and then that's going to be causing the shoulder pain and then the collapses in the shoulder then there has to be a bend or more of a dense band yeah. formed in the shoulders then the neck and then the eyes yeah so that's interesting so what kind so then would you say the eyes are more for like migraines, headaches, eye strain? Yes. And visual issues. Because again, we don't just like pull our head forward. We tend to twist. So we've got, and that's where I think we have a little bit of a different understanding than simply these linear bands. Because between the bands where there's all this buildup, then there's the chaos and you know, if, if my head is doing this, mm -hmm. then between this other band, there's got to be a counterbalancing and then there's going to be a counterbalancing so that we're always, you know, playing this, you know, game in our bodies to make sure we don't tip. But the older we get, if we don't understand how to release these bands and create proper alignment, we simply become tighter and tighter and tighter. Right. And then we harden. I, I like what you mentioned that there's the chaos between the bands. Yeah. So... I know you mentioned that you want to focus more like where those bands are, but we still have to work everywhere in the body because the chaos is going to be between the bands, but even intertwined within the bands and everywhere. So ultimately you still need to work everywhere because to even release, let's say the band in your navel area, you might have to address the cause to that buildup. Yeah. Am I accurate with this? Yeah. So it's, that's why you just have to keep it simple and just I know. And focus that's, on the full body by just having the knowledge of where these bands are. That's a great area to, of course, focus on. But and then, also why it's so important to address the joints. Because let's say as a woman, I have cellulite and I'm going to be working where I see this patterning of adhesion. The levers, though, which is where these bands are going to get really thick and dense, this is the holding pattern. So the knees are the levers of the lower body. Of course, the ankle, if we're pronating or supinating, that's going to affect everything up the chain. So if I spend all this time 
working on my legs, like between my knee and my hip, because it's my, my, the backs of my legs or whatever that I don't like. If I don't actually release where these bands get super, super hard and tight, I can spend all the time in the world and make, you know, mm -hmm. some gains, mm -hmm. but then those patterns are going to pull me back into that negative alignment right. again very quickly too, if we don't release those joints. Yeah. So we need to release pretty well all areas in the body, but then we have to rebuild the structures yeah. and the joints and where these bands are located. And we teach a lot of that as well. And that's pretty well the formula to release the tension, release these bands so that you can A, be pain-free, correct your posture because a lot of people care about people are becoming more conscious of their posture now because they know that it's getting so poor yeah specifically due to technology and then this is what's going to also help you feel better improve mobility rid your pain we talk about myriad of of issues and ailments that we address so that's As, and that's a great point sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but that's a great point because when i see i in fact i saw this lovely girl as I was driving, sitting outside at a Starbucks, and she might have been, well, a teenager, say 16 or 17, but the rounded back that she had because of that collapse, because she's just obviously has been growing up in front of her technology. And it's just so fascinating to see the changes over the generations of these fault lines, because we're not playing the same as we used to. We're not using our body the same as we used to. We're becoming so sedentary and that's really taking its toll on the posture of all of us, but specifically the youth today. So um, I know we'll have lots of great conversations where we're actually addressing the youth specifically, but this is such an important thing because if you think about the organs through here, and this collapse and the squeezing of those organs and then how, because we're falling out of balance that way, how the adhesions start developing through the organs and they tie and they twist everything and how that's so in line with what we're seeing as challenges for the youth today. Mm. So most importantly, and I, and I love it because so many of our community members that start to look at the body say, okay, now I can't look at a body without seeing the imbalances. That's what we want. We want people to really be able to see when a body is out of balance because that's going to give them that impulse to become aware of their own and make changes. Mm -hmm. And it, it is fascinating to see what, you know, lifestyle does. I mean, genetics is there, but I actually believe that it's very little in what goes on in how we age is what we're born into. It's more how we choose to live. And I think this is such an important thing we can see because the youth live differently than my generation and we're seeing those potentials but those potentials are aggravated to such a degree that those schultz bands are being like you know like we're really Don't seeing those fault lines that much greater in what's happening in the postures today can you see these bands on people when you look at them can you almost like i i i know for myself i <laughs> And I, I still am like fairly intense, but I was very intense when I was young and I was quite collapsed. And you always told me to bring my shoulders back and down ever since I was like really young, eight years old, let's say. And I can still feel to an extent a bit of this band here. Mm -hmm. So right below um, my, what is this? Like Zyphoid the, the, process. The yep. Zyphoid process. Yeah. Right in around here. I have like, I can feel... It, it's cool now because it used to be more wire, like dense, thicker wires, yeah. but now it's releasing and there's like more smaller wires. So I know it's starting to actually release, but this is for sure a band on me. I know this is like a pretty intense band and this is what really wants to pull my shoulders forward. I feel that within my navel, it's released quite a bit. And so yeah, going back to the question, can you physically see these bands on people? Yes, you can. Um, like, especially like if you see somebody with like a little bit of um, a ballooning belly, mm -hmm. like it's where those fault lines are. It's where those it's literally are going to be. The squeezing. The squeezing. Yes. That, that's super interesting because if you're suffocated here, suffocated in the navel, then the ballooning is going to happen here. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to work on the ballooning. You want to work on, let's call them the fascia bands. Fascia bands. And yeah. the, uh, the cause to that. 
That's very cool. So then that's how you can relate it to cellulite uh, as well, because let's say you have cellulite on your thighs, mm -hmm. then is can that be caused from extremely tight fascia bands within the joints above and below? It guaranteed. And it's interesting because when I look at women, because again, it's primarily women that we're going to see issues of cellulite in the legs. Um, and for a couple of reasons, A, we've got more fat in our body. We also have a greater Q angle. So we have more space to fall into. And working again, just in those areas, isn't going to release the adhesions because the holding patterns are the joints. And you might release it to an extent and you might see some yes. change, but then it, it's if the bands aren't released, they're still going to be torquing and twisting. Yeah. So when I look at people with cellulite, more often than not, and there's always exceptions to the rules, um, they have extreme, not extreme, but they have external rotation of the feet. I've rarely seen a woman who has, is standing like pigeon. a pigeon yeah. with cellulite hmm. because of the nature of how that's going to cause a collapse in the body, that external rotation, and then that's drawing that twisting away. So between the Schultz bands or the fascia bands, because again, we'll say there's one in probably two in the knee above and below the joint as well as the hips in between that space is where the spiraling happens and that's where we're going to see those you know grips that create the appearance of cellulite okay so give me a protocol i have cellulite on my thighs primarily on my thighs let's say on my glutes as well okay where where would you tell me to focus on the first thing we need to do is we need to look at your feet because i can work up through here i can even work the knees but the calves and the feet are the most frozen, furthest from the engine. So if we don't change that, if I even spend all this time on my knees, but I haven't changed my ankles and my feet and, and that alignment and created a really solid foundation there, every time I take a step, I'm going to get pulled back into that negative system. Mm. So in our 21-day pelvis, legs, and feet program, that's exactly what we do. We focus first calves and feet. So every day we have a class where we release and then we have an alignment training where we rebuild. We do that for one week, then we move up to the next week and then we address the knees and the thighs, and then we address the hips and the pelvis. So in that 21-day program, we go through a very specific ordering to make the work most efficient. Because if I start up at the, at the pelvis and I work my way down, I'm going to be undoing a lot of the gains that I'm going to be making day to day, even just because as soon as I start walking, if I've worked my pelvis, but I walk, then I'm going to be pulling my body back in, where if I start at that foundation and create that really good build from the bottom up, then I keep adding the gains into my system as opposed to running in circles. So do you think there would be consequences if, because you can see why people want to work where the cellulite is. Oh, totally. sure, you still want to and you'll need to, but that's not going to be the cause. So if I were to, they call it scraping. So you can get like a dull knife or the opposite side of like a butter knife or something. There's other tools that you can use that are metal and you scrape or you could blast with certain tools in there what kind of so there are people that will notice those benefits yeah of a reduction in cellulite but then they have to really keep up with it or else it starts to almost get worse and i'll tell you why it gets worse is because those different modalities where you're working through those surface layers in that way where you're scraping we're breaking adhesion as opposed to melting adhesion. Right. So it's almost, it's kind of like it's, it's an, an injury. injury. Yeah. And then it can, if you don't heal that properly, it can create more density, more scar tissue because it's trying to rebuild. So let's, and let's actually talk about this because it's important. So like the difference between our system and a lot of other approaches is that in the system that we have, we're systematic. And after we melt, we pump that blood and oxygen into that open space and then we own it. And that's why there's three pillars to make the system what it is. If all we're doing is we're approaching the adhesion, which would be the first pillar, but they're approaching it through more of a forceful action, mm -hmm. then we're not melting to create the space and, and pump blood and oxygen in, mm -hmm. we're breaking. Mm -hmm. And yes, if I do that really quickly on my thigh, I'll get that blood in that space then, but then what, right? So like that's where more scar tissue will develop because now we've created injury now the body's going to send more collagen. And if we haven't been taught proper breathing, and, and that's the thing, there's so many, so many people ask us, like, what's the difference between this fascia decompression and other techniques? 
it's that it's not just about the getting rid of the adhesion. It has to be about the whole body mm -hmm. and the cellular alignment and mm -hmm. understanding the fascia and its role in keeping those cells in correct alignment because we ultimately want to have space. So if there's not the understanding of maintaining cell alignment and optimal space in the body, then we're just going after scar tissue for a result that mm -hmm. isn't about really transformation. Mm -hmm. And we need to transform if we want to create lasting changes mm -hmm. that are going to continue. Yeah, I can totally see why people gravitate initially towards a forceful action because they might see quick results, but then they don't understand the consequences to it. Oh, like me starving myself when I was young. Like, it's like, okay, I want to lose 20 pounds. I'm not going to eat. Okay. Well, that's not a good approach, yeah. but it's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, like totally. there, there's this urgency to get the change in how we look. Usually that, that vanity drives us really strongly. Um, but at what consequence? And I mean, I ended up with a horrendous metabolism because for when I was 17, I really started to like not eat. And it was great for the first two, three months. I was able to have enough strength inside my psyche to basically eat like five, 600 calories a day. I was losing weight. That's I was insane. getting compliments. <laughs> I know it was insane, but then I wasn't able to maintain that. So then I somehow unconsciously shifted where suddenly I'd be starving myself from like Sunday night to Thursday and I'm in university now. Mm. And then from Thursday to Sunday, I'd be like, you know, partying, I'd be you know, eating and not thinking for so. Chaos. Yeah. So I went from like gorging to starving to gorging to starving. And in the beginning that worked to a degree, but then it got to the point where, cause I was stepping on that scale every day to see what was happening. I got to the point where during those days of starvation, nothing was changing on the scale. That's a scary moment when suddenly like depriving yourself of calories isn't changing what's happening in your body. Mm. I totally understand why now, yeah. but back in that day, it was extremely challenging for me and it threw me into a huge depression yeah because i suddenly wasn't able to manage or even understand my body and and how to feed it anymore and how to look at it without hate when it when it comes to healing anything with lasting change in the body it takes a bit of time yeah it's similar to going to the gym and you're wanting to look a certain way and build a certain amount of muscle there's no shortcuts really other than PEDs, which are performance enhancement drugs, so steroids, of course. Sure, that can balloon you up quicker, but it takes time. And there's a point and there's a reason why our body responds the way it does. Similar to me trying to heal from certain issues. We all have issues um, within our body. So me trying to heal from certain things when I had those skin rashes that were randomly surfaced, they're... It's so interesting the different perspectives I got and oh, well, just like put this topical thing on your, on your skin, but it only happened when I came out of a hot shower and it felt like my skin was burning and it looked like a third degree burn. Of course, you know this very well, like I showed you all the, yeah. and we've had so many discussions about this, but it wasn't until I changed the inside of my body yeah. and I had to go through some intense cleanses and I took a lot of these protocols that I learned and I do them every single day because I also want to prevent things from happening in the future because we are affected by a ridiculous amount of toxins, heavy metals, everything in the air. It's not even just what we eat. It's in the air. So we have to be able to detoxify quite effectively. So the whole point of this is you can't find all these quick fixes. There's so many people that are trying to do extremely quick fixes. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. And that's why when it comes to managing your back pain, you can't just necessarily crack it back into place and then it's going to feel better or you do a couple stretches a day and it's going to feel better. You you have to understand how long it took for you to actually get into the into that pain or the chronic pain. You would have ignored the little signs or symptoms that were telling you like, low back's a little painful here. Okay, there's some tension. There's some tension. You're ignoring it. There's some tension. Hello. And then it's like, boom. Now you just like blew a disc in your back or something. Yeah. So to reverse that, it's not going to be a quick, easy fix. You have to address what caused it. And that can take a little bit of time and you have to be patient with the process. It's amazing how fast block therapy works and fascia decompression works. But again, it doesn't come down to just 
a quick scrape or a quick this or a, a pill or a surgery or anything. A surgery is probably the quickest, fastest acting procedure you could do with the intention of ridding you from pain or from really anything. It That's someone we would always view as like the last resort. So you, you almost want, it, it's just, it's, it's funny how I look at the systems we have in place and what we're taught mm -hmm. where we really need to just stop ignoring the signs of whatever's happening. So for me, yeah, like my liver was backed up. That's what caused my skin to do that rash. Any, almost any issue with the skin is primarily caused from the liver. So detoxify the liver. Yeah. So and, and it's really comes down to understanding nature. We are natural human beings. Like we, we live in nature. And again, this kind of circles back to as above, so below everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. You know, like, again, if you had a big ice block with a butterfly frozen in the center, yeah, we could get to that really quickly by taking an ice chip and like jamming through. And by the time we get to that butterfly, we've probably damaged the wing or like it's, you know, cut in half or something. But if we take our hands and we melt it, and we take the time to melt it by the time we get to that butterfly, it's fully intact. Mm. We can't force or rush melting. We can turn up the heat to increase how right. quickly it melts. But again, like, you know, looking at the river melting in Winnipeg every year, it takes its time. It's not like this, even if suddenly when the river's frozen, if it was 30 degrees, the whole river doesn't melt in a day, even at 30 degrees. There's a process. There's layers and layers and layers to get everything heated up enough that that frozen river now becomes water. Right. And turning up the heat can come in forms of A, just blocking more, breathing more, yeah. correcting your posture more. But then I could also see how food and detoxification can accelerate that process. Because. Corrective exercises. And we see this here in Winnipeg all the time. The last things to melt are those dirty snowbanks. So the more dirt and debris in mm. the ice, the slower it melts. And that's mm. the toxic liver. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, <laughs> that's a really good visual. Another great analogy. So really, it comes down to understanding the body, understanding where these bands are located, where the chaos is. Don't try to be forceful with anything that you're trying to do. And and you got to work the full body. I mean, it's all interconnected. But yes, there's absolutely areas. And that's why we never start on the back. Well, and it's like a migraine. It's like, oh, I have a migraine. Why do, why do people just want to work on the head right away? It's like, that's not the cause. That is not the cause. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. So I guess that's the whole idea of the system and everything that we're trying to teach and preach. And again, block therapy isn't necessarily a one size fix everything or fix all. It's a massive, massive stepping stone. And it can be one of the most powerful ways to get people out of pain or at least manage their pain or whatever ailments they have. You're going to say something. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely not a one size fits all, but to be able to turn on that diaphragmatic breath and understand the point of maintaining internal space, that will change everything no matter what you're starting with or dealing with. Mm -hmm. Because our body is meant to work a certain way. And if we're driving that Ferrari like a 10-year-old, we're going to break. Mm -hmm. If we understand that we have this incredible body housing our soul and we look after it, and it doesn't take a ton of time. It's just the consistency. Again, like if you went for seven days and you didn't drink a glass of water, your system's going to be impacted. We need to drink a certain amount of water every day to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. So we need to, ad adhesions develop continually. Mm -hmm. Like when we're sleeping, gravity's constantly affecting us. So this is a lifestyle. And again, even 15 minutes a day will make an absolute mm -hmm. difference to your fascia system. And that's why it's important to release, integrate, yeah. strengthen, release, integrate, strengthen. You can't just release the whole body at once and then say, oh, now I'm just going to start strengthening and correcting my posture. That's where it's so important. The, the process of releasing, now let's rebuild. Let's release, now let's rebuild. Let's allow your body to start getting used to what you release. Now let's start creating a new fascia memory, new muscle memory and start training the body. And that, that's probably one of the, we talk about this a lot, it's the hardest component is to retrain where your fascia should be. And great on that point, because just yesterday I had one of our members reach out. She's struggling to get past an issue she has. So I hadn't seen her in a while. I said, you know, send me some photos just so I can see what's going on with you. So she does. And 
she's got, you know, crazy left ankle pronation, flat tire, and that's impacting everything up the chain. So I had said to her, like, you know, it's really, really important. We, we can't just block. If you're only blocking, you're not going to hold. Like, you have to integrate these structural foundations. Mm -hmm. And then she said, well, why, why am I not? And it's like, because you're not doing the work. Like, I can't be there breathing for you or support your body in balance and symmetry. Like, that's for us to understand and do for ourselves. And if you, like anything, if you do it for 21 days and then you stop, we're going to get, we're going to fall into those patterns and become mm -hmm. weak. So, um, yeah, the, these machines of ours, they take a little bit of time and care and attention every single day. You brush your teeth every day. Yeah. You sleep every day. You, you know, prepare your food every day. So just give this a good little bit of love every day and, and everything will change for you. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what's so important about making these daily habits. Again, analogy of going to the gym. You want to gain muscle. You can't go to the gym once and expect yourself to look different. You're not going to notice any change at all from doing one gym session. But you also can't go for one month and then get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm starting to see some change and stop and, and stop. Yeah. think it's going to hold. Well, look, look at all, look at every athlete in the world, every bodybuilder in the world. They are, this is their lifestyle. If you want to be an Olympic swimmer or you want to be whatever the case is, a professional hockey player. You don't just go on the ice once a week or you don't just practice for eight hours a day at one time a week and then expect it to be good. You have to cement this memory yes. into your body. And you also have to make sure that the body is always up to date with what it needs to be doing. So if it's swimming, again, it's not swimming eight hours one day a week. It's maybe 20 minutes or an hour. Um, and then that's what adds up. So it's coming back to making it the lifestyle. Find that routine, that regimen that works for you. If that's 15 minutes a day, that is actually good. I would say that's a phenomenal start. I agree. And it, even if it comes down to, hey, well, I got to start rebuilding my foundations. First thing is just understand what your proper posture should look like. So you just have a visual of what you need to do. And then you start to integrate. Then you start to feel what that's like. Then become more aware of, where your rib cage should be aligned, how it feels like to breathe through the diaphragm. And you've done such a great job on your videos on YouTube and TikTok showing that before and after. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, people can find all of this information for free. Oh yeah, well, the combination of the Block Therapy YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, Quinn Castle, and there's so much free content, it's, it's hilarious. But that's also the point. We wanna be able to allow people to start feeling the effects of fascia decompression by using a rolled up towel. How crazy is it? The benefits that people are getting from just using a rolled up towel. So, and that was the whole idea of even like our sampler program, which is a $9 program. It's nine days. We teach you how to use the towel as a fascia decompression tool. Now, of course, it's not as dense as wood, but you still get great benefits. It's a, it's a perfect starting point for people that just want to test it out and see and feel what it's like before they elevate to the actual. And great point. Somebody in our community group um, had just posted and I happened to read it and asked, so why can't we just, you know, lean over um, like the back of a chair and compress and, and all of these different things? And like, what's the difference between if I do that and I create like a nerve compression compared to a fascia decompression? And it was a great question because, yeah, the block is a tool that is really specifically designed to get everywhere, but there's tons of things that we can use as props, but it's not about that. It's about the breath. Mm -hmm. The breath is where the magic comes in and first releasing the diaphragm from the holding pattern that it's in so that we can then turn on the magic in the body. Simply, you know, blocking without the understanding of what the point is that we're doing, why we're seeking pain, why we teach people to move in those directions it's the combination of all of that. And that's where the towel comes in. If you just lie on the towel and you're not following the understanding of how to engage the breath and then how to even move to look for more pain, then yeah, you're just basically leaning on something, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but it was neat just because that was the question, but it's it's the combination of it all, which mm -hmm. again is, is what makes the system what it is. It's like one plus one equals 25. And then you add in the last component, one plus one plus one equals like 100%. So, you know, like we can, we can change so much by just understanding, like you can spend multiple hours a day blocking. If you don't block and engage the breath, 
you could probably spend 20 minutes a day blocking properly and get that much more benefit mm. by turning on that engine. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's amazing. Even even uh, heating up the body before you block, so just going to a sauna. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about that time we were in the Bahamas. Yeah, and it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were working on a client at the time and then you gave me a protocol to do with the block. I'm like, okay, well, you're twisted in this way. You need to do this, this, this. Uh, spend an hour and then let's see your change. So did the protocol. It was hot. It was humid. It was like 35 degrees. Like, yeah. And after that, you're like, that looked like you just blocked for a week, an hour a day. Like it was incredible, the changes. So even going into a sauna or just heating up the body, it's amazing how much more effective we can be at releasing. Of course, you have to initially engage. Or blocking in the saunas. Blocking in the saunas. Too. Phenomenal too. Yeah. So yeah, really cool. Um, I think, is there anything else we want to mention or talk about on this episode? No, I think again, like the, the point of this was really just to teach people to understand their body, their fault lines, where we compress, what's important to address and why. And I think we've covered that. Perfect. Yeah. So more information on just testing this out, testing out fascia decompression, engaging, engaging the breath. Block Therapy YouTube channel gives a lot of instructions with that belly position. That's the first position we always start off with when we teach even a class, even if you're a vet doing this. Any class that you teach always shows the belly position. So if you just want to give that a shot, check out um, the Block Therapy YouTube channel. Uh, my YouTube channel is focused on fascia decompression, but also strengthening the body properly. Um, and that's at Quinn Castellane. And then our domain is blocktherapy.com if you want to just get some free stuff and and check it out. So that is everything for this episode. Cool discussion. I didn't see it going in that direction, but we... Uh, that's the point of these though. They're just yeah, discussions, right? It's exactly. like having a conversation on the couch or the chair. I guess these little <laughs> chairs, these chairs Deanna and I got thought they were going to be like one and a half X the size. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just small, so you probably can't even see them, but they're relatively comfortable. Anyways, thank you so much for tuning into this episode and we will see you in the next one next week. Bye everyone.